Good morning. How is everyone doing? Everybody out of the turkey coma? So the turkey was good. The cowboys were horrible. Just absolutely horrible. But it was, no, not amen. Don't do that. Don't do that. <sighs> Terrible. But the Irish one. So hooray for that. God loves the Irish. But uh, let's pray. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. God, we thank you for this opportunity to, to come together. Father, we just, we are so excited to hear what you have to say today. God, we believe that you are a God of hope, that you are a God that continues to show up. Even when we don't see it, even when, when it doesn't make sense, our trust is in you. So Father, help us to see this through the scripture. Help my words to be clear and your voice to be heard. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So first, I just want to say thank you to Bishop. Thank you for this opportunity uh, to come and to, to share the word. I truly appreciate it. It is not uh, taken lightly. Um, and so just thank you so much for that. But I want to start with a story, right? Because why not? So here's the story. I want you to imagine a menial task, like just absolutely menial. So here, here's the thought that I have. Now, I don't think this exists yet, but it might. And if it doesn't, just know you heard it here first. Because it's copywritten, I want part of this. Okay, so check it out. We have Uber that goes and picks you up and drops you off and gets your food and drops you off, right? What if we had a system where we had people that we paid professionally to stand in line for us? Right, like think about that, right? Like I'm socially distanced at Whole Foods. I just want eggs and I have to wait. There's 16 people in front of me. It's cold, it's disgusting. What if I just had somebody stand in line and then when it was my turn, I come in and I take their spot and I go in, right? Not bad, right? Makes sense? So now let me ask you this. Let's imagine with this, with this idea, right? This professional, this professional placeholder. Let's imagine this happens. Let's imagine there are two identical people who have the job, who agree to do the job. One person is, is agreeing to do it for $10 an hour. And at the end of the, at the, end of the it's a part-time job for them, so at the end of the year, they're gonna bring home another $10,000, which is nice, which is really nice. But the other person now, the other person is doing it a little bit differently. They're making $100 an hour. And at the end of the year, maybe they, maybe they make six figures. Now, when the rain starts to come, when it's cold, when it's miserable, when it's uncomfortable, the two men look at each other. They don't know what they make, but the two men look at each other in the line, and the guy making $10 goes, this is terrible. This just isn't worth it. Don't you agree? Like, shouldn't we just leave? Like, who really cares? Why, why can't people just do what they need? Just wait in line. Like, how American can you actually be, right? But the other guy looks at him and goes, hey, I got no problem. I'm standing in line. I don't, for me, no issue. Now, why is that? Why does one man have not, doesn't have an issue and the other man has an issue? Because that man understands hope. See, hope is recognizing the end. That man realizes that whatever is happening right now is worth it because of what I'm going to get. See, that is hope. That is the story of biblical hope. Biblical hope is not the wish that we make it out to be. Okay, so if you're online, help me out. If you're online, here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to drop in the chat. When I say hope, what do you think of? And here in the, when I say hope, what do we think of? Sometimes I think we think of birthday candles, right? We blow out the birthday candles, we make a wish, and I really hope that this year is the year that I, I lose those last couple pounds, right? That's not that funny. Uh, you know, sometimes, sometimes we, we hope, right? We, we hope. A lot of times when we use the word hope, it usually, we usually mean it as something that we can't control. It's something that's so completely out out of control, something so completely that we have nothing to do with that the best we can do is hope. The best I can do is I can hope, I can hope that my bills are paid. I can hope that the Cowboys win. I can hope, whatever I hope, but I have nothing to do with it. But that's, 
But when we look at a biblical hope, a biblical hope is not that. A biblical hope is literally the opposite. See, the Bible says hope is this. Hope is this place. Hope is not a thing. It's a place. Hope is this place of tension. Hope is this place between here and there. Between God's promise, God's faithfulness, and a reality that I'm in right now. That's the tension. The tension is, I know who God says that he is, but I'm not seeing what he said I would see. So what do I do? Do I just wish? Do I just hope that maybe my vision changes? Do I just hope that maybe, or do I lean into hope? Do I get into that place of tension? Right? Because here's the deal. Any of us that have ever worked out with a band or just a rubber band, right? A rubber band snaps back because of the tension. Right? Uh, if I'm in the gym and I'm using the, the cables, the reason why the cables help me to build muscle is because of the tension that's on them. And so often, when we're in that place of tension, we let go of hope. Right? Because that's not what's supposed to happen. Because here's the problem. We oftentimes can substitute hope for belief. And here's the problem with belief. See, when I hope, I take the evidence of who God's always been which is faithful, loving, just, righteous for me. And I take that, and that's, that's my hope. My hope is in God. When I believe for something, my belief is in my understanding of how it's going to work. Right? So let me say it like this. The Bible says that all things work for, for the good of those that love him. Right? Anybody heard that scripture? Right? Romans 8, 28, right? The, that, uh, the, that all things work for the good of those that love him. Here's what it doesn't say. Hey, Christians, crack the code. So many times we look at what goes on and we have to use our deductive reasoning, our limited, our limited perspective to try to say, oh, here's how it works. Right? I mean, think about 2020. Think about this year. We came into this year saying things like 2020, year of vision. I mean, guys, that, that's not really hard, right? Like 2020 obviously goes with, with eyesight. Like that, that wasn't a tough one, right? But 2020, year of vision, 2020 is going to be my year. 2020, I'm going to do other things I didn't want to do, other things I couldn't do. I'm going to be more social in 2020. You're not. I'm going to go to the gym in 2020. Not doing that either. Not going to do that either. Hey, in 2020, I'm going to, and it's the all I'm going to, I believe, I believe, I believe that 2020 is going to be this and that. And then we look at the evidence and we go, where was God in 2020? Now, let's not make this all doom and gloom, right? Because there are some people, there are, there are some of you out there that, truth be told, this may be your best year ever. And that's real. What if you're a nurse? What if you're a doctor? What if you're working all of this overtime and you're able to get out of debt because of this pandemic? Don't feel bad because of that. What if you've taken full advantage of this opportunity you had to be home with your wife and kids or your husband or your family and you've been able to work through things and love on each other? Then absolutely thank God for 2020 in that way. And that's not to be callous to what goes on, but what I'm saying is that there is no formula, there is no one way to look at the way that God is moving. He's just moving. If I have to wait for the world or even for the body to define how I'm going to see God and what God's doing in my life, I don't know that you've seen him or that you know him. While God is generally good, God is always good. He's always for you. That's true. But he is always specific. He is always moving in your life the way he needs to move for you. So in this holiday season, as we get started, you know, one thing I looked at was this time of year, you want to go back and you want to look at the Christmas stories, right? And, and, and you want to read about them and go, oh, I know all about baby Jesus and Baby Jesus, yay, drummer boy, was he there? I don't know. Magi, no magi, three, not three. I don't know, guys. Like, who cares? But here's the point. The point is when we recognize the birth of Christ, we recognize what hope really is. See, sometimes I think we're so jaded with Christmas because we have Easter. 
See, Easter is the resurrection. Easter is why I get to be with God forever. Why I get to be with loved ones who lived and believed the way I do. Why I get an eternity where all things are made new and everything is made right. That's Easter. But Christmas, I don't, I don't know. We've taken hope and we've kind of turned it into lifetime movies. And we've turned it into the magic of Christmas. We've turned it into the belief of Christmas. So let's do this. I would like to look at a passage today that nobody ever reads. And if you're the person who reads it and you're in this room, okay, you did it, but don't let everybody else know online because it's really weird when you contradict me. It doesn't, doesn't make me look good. But, uh, but so many people, so many people overlook this passage. So um, I'd like you to open up to Matthew 1. So Matthew's the first book of the Old Testament, of the, goodness gracious, of the New Testament, of the New Testament, and this is how the New Testament begins. Now, I'm self-admittedly, I am not into superhero movies. I don't really have much of an imagination, uh, so that's why Batman's my favorite, right? He doesn't have any actual skills. He's just rich, and so that's the kind of superhero I want to be. I don't want to be an alien. I don't want to turn green. I don't want to do any of these other things that these people do. But what you realize in superhero movies is that there's always an origin story, right? And the story of origin always kind of sets it up. And you begin to see from a young age or from, even from, from the beginning of their story how they were set apart. And, and it's kind of the thing that when you're watching it, you realize like, oh, right, that's why he's a superhero and I'm not. I wasn't born on some crazy planet and then got shipped here by parents. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't born in, you know, Wakanda. I just, that's, I wasn't, so I'm not the Black Panther. I wasn't born, whatever it was. I don't have, because of these, or, these origin stories, they set, they're, they're used to set apart. Well, Matthew's first 17 verses is very much like that. Let's read about the genealogy of Jesus. Now, anybody who is pregnant, there are some amazing names here that you should never use to call a child, Okay. These names are clear. If you, have a, if you are pregnant or, or soon to give birth, it is clear. These are quarantine names. This is you have not been out long enough. You've not seen people in enough time. And all of a sudden, you think that Jehoshaphat is the name. It's, it's not. That is not. That's not it. That's not it. But let's read. Let's read. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac, the father of Jacob, Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar, Perez, the father of Hezron, Hezron, the father of Ram, Ram, the father of Aminadab, Aminadab, the father of Nashon, Nashon, the father of Solomon, Solomon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab, Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, Obed, the father of Jesse and Jesse, the father of King David. Let's go. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam. Rehoboam, the father of Abijah. Abijah, the father of Asa. Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, the father of Jehoram. Jehoram, the father of, of Uriah, uh, Uzzah. I'm sorry, Uzziah. Uzziah, the father of Jotham. Jotham, the father of Ahaz. Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah. Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh. Manasseh, the father of Amon. Amon, the father of Josiah. And Josiah, the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. Still not done. After the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shetail. Shetail, the father of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel, the father of Abedhud. Abedhud, you know what it is, you're reading. Uh, the father and the father of uh, Eliakim. Eliakim, the father of Azor. Azor, the father of Zadok. Zadok, the father of Achim. Achim, the father of Elihud. Elihud, the father of Eliezer. Eliezer, the father of, Ma of Mathen. Mathen, the father of Jacob. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. And Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Yes. Yes and amen. Now, you guys are clapping for me because you don't think I can read. And I appreciate that. So thank you, I'll take that. But see, if we go back culturally, you'd be clapping because hope has been fulfilled. See, what you see here is you see 42 generations listed. 42 generations, 42 lines of people, 42 cultures, 42 times that people have been born and died and born and died. And why is that important? Because in 42 generations, nearly 2,000 years, God never forgot what he promised. 
In 42 generations, in 2,000 years, God never forgot his promise. Now, I can sit here and go, man, that took a long time. True. True. I mean, th- look how it starts. It starts, right? Matthew is, Matthew is, is, is Matthew is, I like Matthew. Matthew knows what he's doing, right? Because he starts it like this. The genealogy, the son of David and the son of Abraham. See, if you're going to make an origin story up, if you're going to make an origin story up, you've got to put somebody in a thing that sets them apart, right? And so what sets them apart? What, what is this, this constant hope? See, because with Abraham, Abraham gets a promise, and the promise to Abraham is that you will be, you will be blessed so that you can bless the nations, ergo the rest of the world. Now, Abraham never does that. Him, him personally, he never does that. But it's been promised to Abraham, but more importantly, it's been promised through Abraham. Okay, the promise of God didn't die when Abraham did. So what happens? So what happens is Abraham dies, Isaac is next, and there's still hope. Why is there hope? Because God said it. Why is there hope? Because every time God speaks, something happens the way he says it. Now, even if I don't see it, it has to happen because God can't lie. Right? So if God says, if we hear the voice of God today, open up the heavens and say, Lee's wearing a blue cardigan, here's what's going to happen. We're all going to see this change colors, or we're all going to have a new understanding of what blue is. That's how God works. Right? When he says that it happens, let there be light. Well, how much? Doesn't matter. Let it be, and it happens. That's the God that we serve. So let me tell you. So what happens? So Every single person in this line knew the promise of Abraham. Every single person was waiting to be, to see that blessing, to 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 be to be so blessed, to be so numerous, but they never saw it. So then, well, we have King David. Now, King David, I mean, listen, if you're gonna put somebody, if think about this, right? If you are going to use your family tree as an as an application. Right? Like now we have to be careful because people will go when we get a job or we apply for a job, people will go and look at our, on our internet history. They'll go and see what you said when you were 14 on Twitter and then they want to cancel you for that. Right? What happens when they look at your line, when they look at your family? Are there family members that you would want to kind of move up to the top? I'm like, oh, you know what? You really need, you need to meet my Uncle George because my Uncle George was a CEO for the this, that, and the other thing. Right? Because we always want to put our best foot forward. So that's what we we see David. We see a seed of Abraham and we see a seed of David. What does that mean? Well, God says that uh, forever there would be somebody from the line of David. Forever there would be a king that was there that took the place of David. Well, why is that important? It's important because God set apart David, made a promise to David. And even though war after war, conflict after conflict, mess after mess, God kept his promise to David even when David was dead. See, what if I told you that the promises of God are not about you, but they're for you? The totality of you. God doesn't look at us in terms of here and now. He looks at us in terms of eternity. So when he loves me, when he promises me something, that's for me and those beyond me. So it makes all the sense in the world and it's, it's very hopeful, right, when we see those things. But here's the problem. Before Jesus comes, this 400 years of silence. God is not speaking to his people. So people are trying to figure it out. What do you do? You ever been at work? Kids, young people, you ever been at home? Your mother tells you, hey, listen, do the dishes, and then after that, I'll tell you what the next thing is. So you do the dishes, but she's not there to tell you what the next thing is. Now, if you were anything like me, she knew where to find me, back in front of the TV. I wasn't eagerly waiting for the next command. I was just going back to the thing that was comfortable. So what happens when it feels like God is silent? What happens when we're doing the thing that God said, but we think that maybe he forgot where we were? See, we have this idea that God is everywhere and God knows where we are, except when we're doing the menial thing, when we're standing in line for somebody else. Okay, so that's one thing we can look at, right? From from this genealogy, we can see that God's word takes time. From this genealogy, we can see that God doesn't have a problem 
with, with the good people, with the blessed people. I don't know why we have this idea that hope, the hope of Christ is only for people who are hopeless. Why, why the hope of Christ is only for people that are destitute and that are down and out. But it's for kings. It's for some of the richest people in the world. Why don't we evangelize people who have resources? Why don't we? When was the last time we put a mission strip to Greenwich? Now, maybe that doesn't make sense online, but wherever you are, wherever the, 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 the place of your town, your state, where the big houses are, and maybe there's a, a, a view over the sea, when's the last time we went over there? When's the last time we prayed and believed for their salvation? Or do we look at them like the kings and, and, and the forefathers of our faith and go, well, I mean, they got everything they need. What, what more can they want? See, because this is what we do, and, and I get it, and we should, but... We look at some of these other names. Now, what's interesting, again, if we're looking at this in terms of a resume, think about your own family. Let's be honest. If your boss, right, was about to give you a promotion, and the question was, I need to look at some old home videos, and I need you to point out each one of your relatives in these videos so that I can get a better understanding of who you are. Are there there's some videos you might want to hide or some people you might want to cut out? I'm just wondering. I'm, I'm not saying I would, but I'm saying maybe some cousins, maybe they might look like they're in witness protection. They might have the blurry face and the, and the distorted voice. That's all I'm saying, right? And here's the thing. If you're looking and you're going, oh, Minister Lee, that's terrible. That's because that's you. They're editing you out. Like, I'm just being real. Truth is, I probably was edited myself, but, but let's look at this. Why is that important? Listen, uh, we talk about this culture, and this culture, whether you like it or not, this culture, it's not today's culture. This was a very patriarchal, man-centered culture, right? The, the man is first. The man has the power, all of these things. There are five women listed in this genealogy. If you include Mary, there are five women. Four of those women are not just listed for fun, they go back to the idea of why. Each woman has a story. Let's look at it real quick. The first woman we see is Tamar. Well, who is Tamar? You have to go back, and trust me, it's in the Bible. I wouldn't say it, especially with the internet. You can fact check me right now. But you can, you can go, and you can read the story of Tamar. The way this story ultimately ends is Tamar ends up dressing, or, or, or dressing as a prostitute and ends up sleeping with her father-in-law because she would not get what was rightfully hers. The only way she could do it was by being shrewd. She does this and he impregnates her. And this is what Matthew thought was important for us to know. Matthew thought it was important for us to know about this incestuous relationship. Okay, well, who else? We have Rahab. Now, Rahab is not even Jewish. Rahab is from a totally different tribe. That wasn't even a thing, right? Like. We have, a, we have enough of an issue to be like, well, are you from New York or New York City, right? Because those are two different things, right? But we look at this, we look at this, and this is completely different. Your identity, and not only, is your, not only do I not identify with you, but she was a prostitute. And she wasn't, per, she wasn't like being a shrewd prostitute, like that was her job. That was her last name, Rahab the prostitute. Matthew thought it was important enough to keep in here. Now, we have Ruth. Ruth is another outsider, another woman who is not Jewish. Ruth comes from another country. Ruth is a widow. She's poor. She has nothing. There are literally, she has no prospects. She has nothing to the point where her and her mother-in-law are just ready to die. Like, they look so terrible that they changed her mother-in-law's name. Her name was Naomi, and when they saw her, they called her Bitter. That sounds a little worse than 2020. Nobody's changed my name. People may say I look tired, but they don't go, there, there is tired. <laughs> and then finally, we see a reference to a woman. We see a reference to, to Uriah's wife. Now, what's so interesting about this one is this. They don't use the woman's name. Now, if we've studied a little bit, let me, this goes back, this goes directly to King David. Directly to King David, what we see is King David, obviously a king. 
King David's running for his life. He's got these, these mighty men of valor that run with him. Basically his CIA, his security team. And one of these guys, Uriah, one of his, his, his most loyal, loyal guys is with him. And so the Bible says when David was supposed to be at war, right, already, spoiler alert, he's not where he's supposed to be. When David was supposed to be at war, he wasn't. And so what happened? He fell. How did he fall? He ends, up, he ends up being on the roof. He sees Uriah's wife taking a bath, and quite literally, the rest is history. They get together. He tries to cover it up. Because he can't cover it up, he kills him. He kills one of his best soldiers, one of a close friend, just so he can be with this man's wife to make him his own wife. And then Matthew has the audacity to say, oh, and then what happens is that, well, she's Solomon's mother, and then Solomon was the father of, and then we go through this thing. Why am I saying this? What does this even have to do with hope? This is what it has to do. You are never out of hope. See, in the moment, do you think that Rahab thought, wow, the son of God, a God I don't even worship, a God I don't even know, but the son of God is going to be my great, great, great grandson? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Do you think Tamar was saying, man, if I do this, somehow if I end up getting my father-in-law to, to, to lay with me and to get me pregnant, then what's going to happen is this must be the way God wants it to work. Can I tell you that God is not concerned about the circumstances? He's concerned about the heart. If we can maintain hope, if we can continue to push, when, it get, when we come to the place of tension, if we can go and lean into it to work it out, that's what we're talking about. That is biblical hope. So what in the world does that look like today? Great story. Fantastic. And okay, but what do we do? Well, let's talk about it. What does this year look like? For some of us, it's been rough. It really has. We've lost people, lost opportunities, lost jobs, lost money. Again, for other people, we have absolutely quietly felt guilty because it's been such a fantastic year. But wherever you are, whether you've lost it all or you've never been more prosperous, the only way that your story gets into the, this genealogy is through the grace, the grace of God. See, because Abraham and David were not good enough on their own. Or it would have said, David, the son of Jesus. Didn't happen. Abraham, the son of Jesus, directly, didn't happen. But what did happen was this idea that we continue to press on. God continues to be patient with us. See, when this is written, you've got to understand, when this is written, the idea that the baby form of God, a physical manifestation of God, a baby was here, was all they needed. That is why we have these beautiful hymns. That is why we celebrate Christmas. We celebrate Christmas because a baby who's done nothing is capable of everything. That was their hope. He was here. They saw him. There's a story with Anna and Simeon where these two older people who've been praying their entire life, I just want to see him. And they see him and they prophesy and they die happy. Seeing an eight-day-old baby. Eight-day-old babies all look the same. What was so special? It was the hope. It was the revelation of hope. It was the revelation that hope is here. That God finally, he moved now. He moved right now. So what does that mean? See, again, I told you that sometimes we lose Christmas because of Easter. Why is that? See, 2,000 years it takes to get to Jesus, but those 2,000 years since, our lives are completely different. 2,000 years later, 30 years after uh, Jesus is born, he starts a ministry. Three years after that, he's crucified. When he's crucified, he dies. When he dies, we lose hope. The whole, the whole world goes black. Everything he said he was going to do, everything he said he was going to be, we, we, can't, we can't believe that anymore because he's gone. But he said he would come back, but even still... You know, it, somehow it made more sense. It was, easier to, it was easier to reconcile the idea that Rahab and Tamar and Ruth are, are grandmothers of Jesus than it is that Jesus can raise himself from the dead. 
So here we are. The third day comes. Go to the tomb. The tomb's empty. We see Jesus. And this is our story now. See, our story now is not the story of, oh man, I really hope Jesus comes. Our story is hope is here. Hope is here. Wherever you are, hope is here. At the, I don't care if you're listening to this six years from now. I don't care if while you're doing it, you're driving and you have a bottle between your legs. Hope is here. It's here. It's here. See, it's not here because I say it's here. It's here because it's never left. You were born into hope. He came from glory to us. He left, he left the, everything that he had to come here. He made himself new to come here, to vulnerable to come here because hope is here. Hope is here. So what do we do with it? See, as I, as I start to wind down, I just want to leave you. I'm going to leave you with this question. See, because if we're Christians, our hope has got to be beyond circumstance. The reason I come into this is because I know even if tomorrow is terrible, forever is guaranteed. That's the Christian faith. My faith, not that I'm silly about it, not that I don't wear a mask or any of that stuff, but the truth of the matter is when it's all said and done, my hope is not that it will work out. My hope is that it's already done. Work out or don't work out, it doesn't make a difference for me. See, my hope is that one day when my daughter, my daughters or my son go through the genealogy and they go, oh, and Lee, the father of Micah, the father of Lydia, the father of Abigail, who gives a legacy of hope, a legacy of faith, a legacy of trust. And because of that, we look at that and we follow that family line. And I recognize that it didn't start with me. I recognize that I had praying grandmothers and I recognize even before that people I didn't know we're praying and believing for me for generations they couldn't see. That is the hope. So what are you hoping for? What are you hoping for? Are you hoping to be accepted? Well, don't. Because he loves you. Forget about acceptance. Accepted? I don't want to be accepted. I want to be loved. I want to be loved. Are you hoping for happiness? Forget that. Hope for joy. Because it's already yours. Are you hoping for promotion? No, forget that. You already have a position. He calls you son. He calls you daughter. What are you hoping for? What are we hoping for? And what are we doing in the meantime? See, it's easy when we look at our, when we look at our history, we look at this and we say, well, that works for this one and that works for that one, but God can't do it for me. You don't know where I've been. You don't know what I've done. You don't know what I'm doing even now. And you're absolutely right, I don't. And I don't want to say this callously, but I don't really care. And I don't care because Jesus says it this way. In Hebrews 2.11, it says, Jesus, the Holy One, makes us holy. And sons and daughters, and as sons and daughters, we now belong to his same Father, so he is not ashamed or embarrassed to introduce us as his brothers and sisters. There is nothing you can do to make Jesus, God, or the family of God embarrassed or ashamed. There is nothing that you can do to shame yourself, to be so far out of this, this, this lineage, this heritage, this family. There is nothing, nothing. Some of you have been trying. Some of you have, have, have done everything you can to say, see, I can't do it. I couldn't do it. I knew I couldn't do it. You keep making me. Hope is here still. See, to get into any family, there's a price. There's blood. And so there's a blood adoption where we are his sons and his daughters. And if we recognize that and we believe that and we live as though that is true, that will shape the future. That will shape the way we deal with what's going on. And so my question for you today, what are you hoping for? And what are you doing in the meantime? Because when Jesus comes in, hope is restored and you are adopted into his family. And so whatever it is, align it with what God has already said about you. Align it with who he says you are. So today, I'm going to pray. 
And today, I'm going to invite you, whether you're here in the building or if you're online, and I'm going to invite you to make a commitment. I'm going to invite you to make this, take this opportunity to assess what areas are you just believing? And what areas are you believing that God can or he should or he might? And can you change that with hope? with the evidence that God has done it before and he wants to do it again. With the evidence that everything that he has for you is for you. And even if you don't see it, even if you don't get to taste it, is it worth, is it, worth it enough to hope for generations that are yet to come? Is it worth it to hope for your coworkers and your family? Is it worth it to hope for strangers? Because it's that hope that separates us from all of the other things in this world. It's a hope that's based on evidence. Paul says, always be willing to give an account of the hope that you have and do so with gentleness. So God, we thank you today. Father, we pray. We pray that your word, your word, finds good soil. Father, that your word of hope, Father, that it can be planted and it can grow. So God, we thank you for all that you've done. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you that we can trust you. We thank you that never have you let us down. And we recognize that when we stand here and look back, God, that your fingerprints have been on it. Even when we didn't see it and it didn't make sense, we were never alone. And so if you're online, and you want to be part of this, and you want to be part of this family of hope, and you want this hope, not something that we're selling, but something that was freely given to us, and so we are freely giving it to you. If that's what you want, there's a link on the bottom of our screen, and it says, I have decided. You can click that link right there. You can click that link, and we'd love to get your information so we can follow up, and if you're here in the building, we would love to talk to you. We would love to help you to, to build this relationship, to build this walk, to figure out what does hope look like in your life. It's not a formula. So church, we thank you. God, we thank you today. And we go into this season of hope in a new way, with new eyes, looking to see what maybe we've missed. We pray all of these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen and amen. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you throughout the week. Thank you so much. 10 o'clock.